Okay, so how's it going? So for today's episode, I have a, a very special guest here, someone who I'm very thankful for them taking out their time to, to come and speak to me on a, today's podcast episode. Uh, she's someone's work I've been following for a little while now, uh, for a good while, actually, and, and uh, full of knowledge, definitely knows what she's talking about. And uh, we can all, me and you included, so me and, and the listener can definitely learn a, a good thing or two here today. But otherwise, I won't say too much, Susan. I'll let you introduce yourself, what you do, and then we can go from there. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to see you and, and, and to be able to chat with you. Um, yeah, I'm Susan Ebergal. I own Susan Ebergal Fitness, and I'm also co-coach in, this, in the Inner Circle with Jordan Syatt. Um, and I am just a 61 soon to be very soon to be 62. Actually, I just thought about this today. <laughs> um, you're old, you know, I'm 61 years old and just trying to keep getting stronger and building muscle and someone who kind of turned everything around in my mid fifties, you know, and, um, my message is, is to get out there to everybody that it's never too late to change. I mean, it was ne- not too late for me. Um, and I'm just a regular person. I'm not an athlete or especially talented in this area at all. Um, I'm just someone who surrounded herself with the right people, took some responsibility on what I was and was not doing for all of those decades and uh, finally turned it all around. And so my message is it's never too late. And that is actually the subtitle of my book. Uh, I wrote a book called Fit at Any Age, It's Never Too Late. And that's just basically a kind of a fitness memoir of all the fitness mistakes I made uh, for many, 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 many years um, and how I turned it all around. And then how that confidence affected me starting a business and, and, and starting in the inner circle and the story behind all of that. So um, yeah, it j- just want to spread the message that it's just never too late to change. Yeah. Uh, I had a, I have a, a few things I wanted to ask you about now, like touching upon on the book, what inspired you to write a book? Cause you know what? I'd really love to do that one day, maybe not anytime soon, but it's definitely a goal. You know, it, it it was interesting. I thought, you know, I, I did a lot of crazy, I, I look back on the things that I used to do to try to lose weight or, or or whatever. And, you know, back being as old as I am, we lived through my generation, we lived through a lot of crazy stuff, right? And um, I tried it all probably, <laughs> mm-hmm. maybe not all, but I tried a good bit of those things. And I wanted to let everybody know, you know, you're not alone. I, I mean, I did this stuff too, you know, it, it it is something that is relatable to a lot of people in my generation. Um, we all did this. And the message behind it is, look, it's okay. We all, we all screwed up. We all did crazy things, but you can turn it around. And so I thought, this is why I want to write the book. It's a simple read. It's not like, you know, really complicated. It's just a story of me and, and all the crazy stuff I made and kind of I did and the story behind that and then just the shift. And how the shift happened and um, and then just some advice for moving forward for anybody. There's some workout stuff in there and all that. It but but it's just a chance for me to show, look, this is what I did and I can turn it around. You can do it too. And that's the best feedback I've gotten from people is this could have been me. I, I talked to somebody yesterday who said that it's like you wrote a book about me. Mm. And then so I'm learning that wow, more people than I even thought actually did a lot of this stuff. I mean, we're, there's a bunch of us, like tons and tons and tons of us that made those mistakes. Um, so I wanted just to, to, to keep putting out the message that, yeah, you can do it too. Um, it's not impossible. Mm. And, uh, and I haven't actually read your book yet, but it's on my reading list. I really, I do. Uh, I, I really would like to read it at some point. And, and so I don't know if you mentioned this in the book, but when you started focusing on your fitness, was it and this is just me asking out of pure curiosity. Did you feel like it was maybe too late? Were you kind of like, uh, I don't know, like I'm only kind of doing this because it's kind of, it's maybe, you know, it's good for me, but I don't want to. Was it a lot of that? No, I, no, I don't think so. I, um, in the book, I talk a lot about like how I got exposed to being in the gym, doing classes, like a lot of people's intro into a gym or classes. That was mine too, back in the nineties. Mm-hmm. And um, then I just became, a gym rat, I would hire trainers and I started learning and I love to lift. So I have a history of loving to work out and exercise, but I never had all the pieces of the puzzle put together. I had the workout piece kind of down, um, but I never had nutrition down until I was in my mid fifties. Never. Um, I thought I did, 
but I never did, which was evidenced by all the yo-yoing that I was doing. You know, I couldn't, I could lose weight because I lost weight way back in the, I think it was late eighties, early nineties when I did Jenny Craig, which is a, a meal service kind of, you buy their food, it's all pre-portioned and everything and you lose weight. <laughs> And it, that did happen. I ate their food and I lost weight, but I couldn't keep it off because I didn't know anything. I mean, I didn't know how many calories I was eating. I didn't know about protein. I didn't know anything. So I, I really wasn't equipped to go out into the real world and survive on my own, which was evidenced by all the weight. I was just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I could lose weight because I knew how to do that. And, and I went to extremes. I just didn't eat very much, you know? And of course I would lose weight, but I could never keep it off. So there started the yo-yo. So I just didn't have that piece together until I hired Jordan as my one-on-one coach when I was, I think, 54 years old, I think was the first time he and I worked together. Um, and so, you know, like any, I'm a teacher uh, by trade. I mean, I, I, I'm a retired teacher and school counselor and you know, as a teacher, I want to be a good student too, when, when I'm trying to learn. So when I hired Jordan, I did everything he said, and I, you know, I read everything he wrote, watched everything he put out there. And I started implementing a lot of nutrition things with him. Mm -hmm. Although I didn't go to him for nutrition, I went to him for, I thought I wanted a power lift. So I went to him for that, but, but then he and I clicked and he, you know, he was so supportive and I started learning and more and more about nutrition and all those pieces that have been missing for decades finally started getting put together. And so from my mid fifties to the present, that's when I've been serious about it. Like all the pieces to the puzzle started to fall into place, but I've been in the gym for a long time before that, but just never making progress, you know, and I was that person that thought, man, if you work out four days a week, six days must be really good, you know, or seven. And sometimes I did two a days mm -hmm. because with one day is great. Two days must be, I mean, two times a day must be like, you know, phenomenal. So um, I, I didn't have a great relationship with exercise, you know, for decades either. So I kept obviously spinning my wheels, mm -hmm. but so I have a long history with the gym, just not as long a history with nutrition. Mm. And I, I feel like one of the things that you said there where uh, it was, um, you thought you knew a lot about nutrition, but <laughs> I think, and but you, uh, you know, now you realize that you didn't really. And I think that's actually something I see a lot. Like, that's a very common theme. I only yeah. people who say, oh, you know, I know exactly what I need to do. But you know, I, I will see from the sidelines, you know, it's baby being, it's been like two, three, four, five years. And if I feel like if you're, if you're still struggling, then maybe some people have to, I don't know, consider that maybe they don't really know what it is they have to do. And this thing, this in, this goes for the old me as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I feel you. That, that was totally me thinking I'm eating clean. I'm eating healthy. I don't need to worry about portion sizes because my God, I'm eating all this great food, right? But I was eating a lot of it. Um, I was not allowing myself to have certain foods because they were bad. They're going to ruin my progress if I have anything outside of my little food bubble. And, you know, you can't survive like that. That's mm -hmm. not how we want to live our life. But I thought that's what I had to do. And the thing is for, and I, I, I speak in terms of decades because of my age, I can, you know, there's, there's been many decades where I believed a certain thing, you know, I believed food was either good or bad for decades and getting that out of your head is not, I mean, it's not going to go away overnight. So I think that's why people, especially my age struggle with trying to make these shifts because this is not what we believe for most of our life, mm. you know, and now we're finding out what mm. that's not, that's not carbs. Aren't the devil. What, you know I mean? It, it's like all these, I can have a piece of cake and not worry about me gaining fat overnight. How does that work? You know I mean? <laughs> it's because it's almost like we've been brainwashed sort of, you know, with all this, but it's just because it's ingrained in our heads. So it takes time. Um, but you know, it, once you start breaking through those layers, you're like, oh my God, look mm. at this. This is doable. Like I can actually do this and, and live my life, you know, mm. which is the whole point. Mm. Yeah. I feel, uh, yeah, I, I can definitely re relate to that. I feel like just personally for me, I think the biggest shift in re regarding, regarding the nutrition was when I actually helped reached out to someone. I was like, uh, cause it was the first time I hired a coach because before that I was like, I know what I'm doing. Like, 
I don't need any help. And then, you know, I was like, one day I was like, you know, I'm being, I'm being too consistent for the lack of results that I'm getting. So I was like, okay, I think I need some help. I reached out and it, yeah. And just surprise, surprise the, yeah, the guidance definitely made a difference. It's interesting because when I first hired Jordan right before that, I had kind of an aha moment, Um, you know, I, I, and I write about this in the book too, about how I walked into my bathroom and I looked down at my belly and I'm like, what has happened to me? Here I am a fitness professional and look at me, you know, how did this happen? And then I started thinking about menopause. Oh, well, I'm that age. Of course, that's the problem. This is happening to me. I need to go see my doctor. So I went to go see my doctor thinking, okay, there's, there's a metabolism issue, thyroid, whatever, you know, it's all about menopause. I was going to get the medication. I was going to take it. Everything's back to normal and I will be able to drop this weight. And, um, my blood work came back fine. So there was nothing wrong with me. And that's how it is with almost everyone. Very rarely is somebody going to come back with a legitimate physical condition, right? Mm -hmm. But we like to think that it's a metabolism thing that's slowed down and now, you know, it's happening to us. And, and that's a victim mentality that I was totally in, you know, and, and when the doctor told me everything was good, I felt like I'd got gotten kicked in the gut because I felt like, well, I, I, it was not what I was expecting. And now it was kind of like, oh crap. Now I've got to kind of look at me. Like I have to look at what I've been doing or what I haven't been doing for decades that has not worked. You know, I have to actually face that. And that is super difficult. When you think you've been doing something for decades the the right way, and now all of a sudden you have to look at yourself and go, wait a minute. Mm. You know, I have to take some responsibility here now. I have nothing else to blame, right? I mean, I used all my avenues. (laughs) And, And so, you know, I had to let that sink in. So After that, I started implementing small changes. I never started tracking or doing anything like that yet, but I just, I started seeing some results. So I'm like, okay, I know what I'm doing now. So then I hired Jordan. I'm like, I don't need, I don't need you for nutrition. I just need you for powerlifting because that's what I thought I wanted to do. But of course, like I said, I read everything and I joined his inner circle, um, which I now help him run um, as an, one of the earlier members. And I implemented a lot of nutrition guidelines from the inner circle. And lo and behold, I mean, things just started to happen. And then he and I started talking more and more about nutrition, you know, as a coach and client. And um, wow, everything just changed. And it was interesting. I feel like once I took responsibility mm-hmm. for, for things that I wasn't doing that I thought I was doing, then then that's when it all kind of changed and that's hard to do it really is yeah it's a it's a reality check yeah yeah a slap in the face sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, so i'm going to assume uh, when you said so you eventually when you started say, when you said you weren't tracking your calories yet eventually you started tracking your calories for once yeah. and what was that like yeah so i did um so i didn't use an app and if i, I I'm not tracking anymore. If I ever decided to track, I would not use an app either. I wasn't, you know, I didn't grow up with this. So the last thing I wanted to do is get on my phone and have to learn a new app and crap like that. I'm like, no. So I I literally, I started with a piece of paper and a pencil and that's how I started, but I graduated to a spreadsheet, (laughs) a simple spreadsheet, literally column what I ate, literally column how much how many calories, how many, how many grams of protein. That's what my spreadsheet looked like. That was it. Um, And that was eye opening because I was totally not even close in my guesstimating of things, you know, Um, when none of us are, we we all suck at that. And I was really awful at it. Um, So it was eye opening, but it's one of those things you, you can use an app and apps are great. I know they make it so convenient. You can scan stuff and they save recipes. And if I actually used recipes, that would probably be really handy, but I don't. So I, you know, I, I don't track at all anymore. I don't need to, but I think if I did, I would probably still go back to a spreadsheet. And just to say that, just because you don't need fancy stuff to do this, right? A piece of paper and a pencil will work if that's what you like. Google can be your friend. How many calories and blah, 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 blah. You know I mean? You, you can really make significant progress that way, right? And, and people are like, well, are the calories accurate? Well, calories in any of these apps aren't accurate either. I mean, they're all accurate 
to to it's all relevant to, i mean to, relevant to where you are right um so we don't we're never going to get the exact calorie but we're, we're going to get close enough you know and um and i think that's what's important is 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 just being consistent and and being close enough with calories and everything and and the cool thing about tracking and i'm a big proponent of it by the way um is I feel like you learn so much mm. and so many people don't want to track. They want to go right. They want to skip over this and go right to intuitive eating, you know? And if you go to intuitive eating, I mean, listen to your body. Well, my body's going to tell me it wants Oreos, you know, <laughs> and I don't need Oreos. You know, at some point that doesn't work. You know, mm. intuitive eating is an advanced skill. Mm. And I really I think, you need, right. And I think you need to spend time learning tracking, learning portion sizes, calories, learn that first yeah. and then give it a shot. You know, um, I think that's a much better progression and that's kind of what I did. So I don't track, I don't have to track anymore. I'm in maintenance mode. I know how to eat, keeping my weight within a three to four pound window. And I've been here for years. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I wouldn't be able to do it though, if I hadn't put in time before. Yeah. 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 I, I 100% agree. There was a few things like, I, so when you were saying that some people, um, due to the inaccuracy, I think some people mentioned that, and that, that is something I've seen online where people will say, oh, there's no point calorie tracking because it's not even accurate. And that blows my mind because yeah. I think. You know what that point. is? That's a justification just to not do it. It's true. That's all it is. You know, yeah. people are using that. Uh, okay. I ain't going to do it. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, yeah. Just because it, does, it doesn't have to be 100% accurate, but as long as you're sure, you know, that is fairly accurate and that's the most important thing yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i mean and it's all relative right it's all relative to where you are yeah um, yeah i agree you know i mean so it, it's it's like i step on my scale here at home and when i go to my doctors i weigh more at my doctors because that scale is calibrated different than mine does it matter if i'm two pounds heavier at the doctor than i am here no it, it doesn't matter at all you know, um, it's just, I use this consistent scale here. So this is how I keep track of my weight and it's all relative. When I go to the doctors, I know I'm going to be about two pounds more there. Mm. Yeah. And the, the reason why I actually went down the calorie tracking conversation from when you mentioned it was because, um, so I, I very loosely track nowadays as well. I feel like I've been doing it long enough and, uh, and yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I'm okay with loosely tracking. Like, I, I, it doesn't matter to me if the portion is a little bit more, a little bit less. I just, uh, and I don't even do it every day. It's like you said, but um, I think this is a, a good point that I don't feel like I see it get mentioned and maybe that much online or maybe I'm just missing it. Uh, but I feel like you you have a group within weight, you know, that maybe they have a, a, a body weight goal and they've been tracking for a while. They've been calorie tracking for maybe a good while. Now they've been consistent with it. I think a lot of people struggle with the exit plan. Yeah, there isn't one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you're right. I mean, the whole maintenance thing, people don't really think about that. And and it, I think people and people view dieting as temporary, like it stops here. And then it's like, okay, so now I'm done. And I used to put that word in quotes, I'm done. Mm. And then it's like, well, I'm just going to kind of do whatever I want to do. And that's the biggest mistake you could make. It, it, it's you're not done. We're never really done, right? We keep uh, progressing. We keep changing our goals, whatever. But we're never really done. Mm -hmm. um, and and so it, it's important to understand how to add some calories back in at a rate that works for you. Some people like it super slow because they don't want to see the scale move, but it's going to move a little. Some people just say, let me have some more calories back in and, and they're okay. But uh, just understanding what maintenance actually is, how it works. It's not a number. It's a range where you just mm -hmm. kind of hover in this little, I call it a maintenance bubble. Mm -hmm. And in the inner circle, Jordan and I even got rid of the word maintenance. We call it momentum because we mm -hmm. feel like maintenance implies stagnation it implies yeah. that you're not doing anything anymore but you actually are in this phase i mean we recommend people go into this phase even if you've been dieting for a while and you need a break like maybe that person you were talking about has been doing this for like a year or something they their head probably needs a break from a calorie deficit you know getting into momentum hanging out there, get some energy on board, some more calories, watch your lifts improve in the gym, all of these good things, sleep might go up, everything may, may improve. And then it gets you ready for whatever you want to do next. And maybe that's going back into a deficit for a little while, or maybe that's, you know what, I want to 
go a little bit higher and go into a mini surplus and see what I can do there. You know, so it's kind of that place that's getting you ready to do whatever your goal is next. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a cool way to look at it as opposed to maintenance, because a lot of people don't even want to attempt maintenance until they've reached their goal. Like they feel like they haven't earned that right yet. Mm -hmm. But what they don't understand is doing periods in maintenance or momentum, as we call it, um, is probably the best thing for long-term sustainability, right? Over time, mm -hmm. um, as far as losing weight is concerned, you know, mm -hmm. um, giving your head a break from thinking about it 24 seven, giving your body a little bit of a break, you know, all these positives about being in maintenance. And then the funny thing is you may get there, you may never want to leave, <laughs> sure. which has yeah. kind of happened to me. <laughs> Yeah. So how, how do you, how does, so how would a person know if it's time for, a, a, I don't know, like a, a maintenance phase? After, you know, after I tell people this, when they ask me that question, I think it's time. Mm. The fact that they're asking that question tells me, you know what, something is up here. You're tired of it. Something's going on for you to even ask that question. Mm. Um, and so that's number one, honestly, I think, Number two, if you feel like you are constantly thinking about calories, planning meals, re, you know, getting your grams of protein, it's on your brain the last thing before you go to bed. And it's the first thing you think about when you get up. And maybe that means it's time too, right? Mm -hmm. You need a break from that. Mm -hmm. Or it could be that your consistency is starting to go downhill. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe at the beginning you were. 90% consistent with hitting all your numbers and, and things and progress was happening. And then progress has slowed up because your consistency has gone down. Mm. That's a big red flag. Mm -hmm. That probably means, you know what, time to time to take a break. Mm. But if you're talking about, I've been doing this for three weeks and nothing's happening. No, <laughs> mm. that, that, you know, it's all relative. You know, we're talking bigger, bigger, bigger chunks of time, not a couple of weeks. I mean, you could stay stagnant for many weeks, right? But over time, if you've been doing this, you know, the people that tell me I've been in a calorie deficit for a year, it's like, no, you haven't. Mm, yeah, just mentally you have. Or, mentally, exactly, yeah. exactly. Mentally, you've been in the calorie deficit mindset. I totally believe that. Mm. But if you've been in a true deficit for a year, you'd be like weighing nothing, <laughs> you yeah. know, at this point, you know? So there's a big difference between the mindset piece and the actual deficit, but the mindset piece can be draining. I mean, yeah. absolutely draining. And that could be the red flag, the bigger red flag. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and yeah, I, I, yeah, it's definitely, it's a, it's, a, it's a great point. And I, cause I think going back to the, along the lines of calorie tracking as well, is just, so obviously you have a group of people who they kind of make every excuse, maybe not to do it. And maybe they, maybe they should try it out for a little while. And then I feel like you have a, a group who actually are very consistent with it obviously you have that group of people and I think when it's time for them because obviously I don't calorie tracking isn't something you want to be doing forever and no, I, I think some people, that. yeah exactly and I think some people <laughs> yeah. but I think some people who have been getting great results from it they get a little bit nervous about coming off of it and they don't know how to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what would you say to that person or what like, I would say yeah. if you are if if the thought of not tracking makes you feel uncomfortable then that's what you need to do first of all and that's going to feel very, very uncomfortable, but you don't have to go from counting everything to counting nothing. I say, pick a day, pick a day during the week. Don't count. Don't track it. Don't put it in your little app. Don't put it on your spreadsheet or on the paper. Just eat like you normally would. Mm -hmm. Don't eat like an asshole. Just eat normally. Just don't track it. And people saying, but I'm going to count it in my head. Okay. <laughs> that's yeah. okay. Yeah, we yeah, all do yeah. that. I mean, just don't track it in the app. Do mm. that one day. The next week, maybe pick two days and do it for two days. And this is how you get off the, 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 um, almost the dependence of, of tracking, you know, one day at a time, add a day every week, every other week, something like that. Um, so then you start understanding that just because you're not tracking, that doesn't mean you're going to turn into this maniac and eat the entire kitchen that won't have people are afraid I'm going to lose control. No, you won't. No, you won't. But you think you will. Mm. It, it always reminds me of like, I, you know, I don't know if, if kids, if, if kids, you know, 
when, when kids are old enough to be at home by themselves and mom goes out running errands, okay, mom's gone. Now we can go and eat this and have this and that, you know, they're going to go crazy because mom's out of the house. That's what I feel like it, people feel like when they stop tracking mom's mm -hmm. out of the house. Now I'm going to eat everything in sight. No, you won't just eat like you would normally eat. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. it. That's mm -hmm. it. And watch, and then after that first time, it's going to get easier and easier and easier to let go of that crutch, you know? Yeah, 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 definitely. I think yeah, that's, I, I try and follow a similar uh, plan with uh, just, you know, one pick, I don't know, every every week or every month, you just decrease it by one day, the amount of days that you're yeah. tracking. And then, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, and you just keep doing that. And then eventually you'll yep. get to the point where you're maybe not tracking for six days and then tracking for one, uh, for one and, and and then you just keep going and progress and then and the beauty of that is then you can mix and match however you want you know every you know i don't i said i don't track anymore and i don't and i honestly at my age i can't think of a one reason why i ever would you know dutifully track again i don't see that in my life anymore but if i want it if i want to keep myself honest a little bit one like a day i'll, I'll say okay i'm gonna just track what i eat today you mm -hmm. know just i eat my normal stuff um, but I'm going to take more time to actually know exactly how much I'm eating and record it just so I, I'm like, okay, I'm thinking I'm eating about this much. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty close to that, you know, just every now and again. Yeah. And, and I think that's the beauty of this, right? Mm -hmm. It can kind of keep you honest mm -hmm. when you're not tracking. And I think we all need that once in a while. Yeah. 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 And, and especially the education that can come with it. Um, yeah. And Actually, I guess this isn't. This is still on the subject of nutrition, but something I wanted to, to ask you about as well. So, let's say, and this is definitely something you must get a lot. Say, like you have someone who, you know, they're struggling to to lose weight, and and they'll blame I don't know one or two trigger foods. That's that's what they'll call it, a trigger food, and they don't know how to, I don't know, stop giving in to that tr trigger food. Mm -hmm. Let's say how how would you, what would you recommend to that person? You know, I think everyone's different. This is very, very, very individual. Um, for so, And I would need to know the person really well before I decide which avenue to go down. Mm. But one avenue is get that food out of your house. Yeah, you know, that's what I and it's, it's temporary. It's temporary. It's not forever. But if you sit there and tell me you don't have control over what you do with that food, that food needs to get out of your house until you can start enjoying some things in moderation. OK, it's not forever. It's just till you can start to do that. The other person may just need a kick in the ass. And you just say, you know what? Tell yourself, no, that's what you do. <laughs> you yeah. tell yourself, no, mm. because it's amazing how. We don't do that, you know, and we actually really control the whole scenario. And that's the cool part about this. People don't really understand. I, I can't control myself. You know, you actually have more control than, than you think, but some people need to get it out of their house first. Other people just need to stop and say, no, Susan, I'm not going to have this today mm -hmm. and turn around and get out of the kitchen. You know I mean? So it's really individual and where they are and especially what their history is. Yeah, I yeah. think that plays a role. You know, if there's binge eating history, then we've got some other things going on there. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been known to give tough love to people when they need it on that side. And I've been known to say, okay, it's time to get this out of the house and and let's focus on improving relationships with food and then we'll slowly bring this in and when you slowly bring something back in make it in single serve small portions you know like a single cupcake instead of buying a dozen or you, mm, you know or you know yes. whatever uh, it, it, something like that or or make it that you have to actually go out and pick up a single serving of whatever it is. You know, it has to be a little harder. It's not just in the cabinet where you can just reach and go. So a, lo a lot of different strategies with that. But it, again, it's just so individual. Yeah, it's very individualistic. But um, you did, yeah, depending on the person, you did touch on one point that I've, I've mentioned in the past and it, it, there was a, a particular member that I had this conversation with. And, uh, and I just said, uh, I think I remember one time, it worked very well. I just said, stop buying the family pack. Yeah, we don't need yeah. we don't need twelve chocolate bars. How about yeah. buying one? Because buying then, one. yeah, and then if you want a second one, you're gonna have to walk five minutes to the shop. So you're gonna yep. have to make sure that you really want it. Yeah, 
yeah and, and so it worked it, it worked surprise, surprise. And, and and another strategy too is for for some people and, and i do this as well look before you go in and reach for that family pack right set your watch your your phone set the timer for 20 minutes before you actually do it to get it, you know, um, it, it, it can out, save. Uh, sorry, Susan. I'm sorry. It, it cut out for a second. I don't oh, know. I, I, I was just saying, if you put some time, some oh, distance yeah, yeah. between you and, and the urge to grab that family pack, you know, 20 minutes, go do something else. You will find that the urge has gone down a lot. And maybe if you still want something, go grab a single serving out of that, put it on a plate, sit down and mindfully eat it. Mm. Don't just reach in there and start, you know, stuff in your face. Mm. take some sit down and eat it or what you might find is you don't have the urge at all it's mm. gone so mm. then you just get on with whatever you were doing you know time putting that little bit of time helps a lot yeah and i think it's much better than telling yourself you can't have it completely because when yeah. you tell yourself you can't have it completely you're going to want it more mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. i totally agree with that and, and i feel like for binge eaters if you feel like you're going to binge on something Put some time between you and that binge. And after that time, if you want to binge, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Allow yourself to do it. Mm -hmm. Because when you allow yourself to do it, like you said, it takes on a completely different feel. You're mm -hmm. probably going to find that you don't eat as much. You know, you're going to eat some, but maybe you don't eat as much because it doesn't, you, you're not saying to yourself, I shouldn't be doing this. This is bad, blah, blah, blah. You, you have allowed yourself to do it, mm -hmm. you know? And so- well, it won't cut it out completely, maybe. I mean, it could, but it will certainly cut it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, I, I do love that, the timing point. It's something that I push a lot as well, I say to, to the people I work with as well. If, mm -hmm. if there's uh, something you really want, then just make yourself wait. Wait 15, 20 minutes. Don't, don't ban yourself from it completely. And uh, by the end of it, you might not want it. It's, it's like you said, you might not even want it. Uh, right. But, yeah. You may not even, yeah. People are surprised like, as to how well that can work. I, I am stunned at how well it can work. And it sounds on the surface like, yeah, no, 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 it, it won't. <laughs> but, but what if I, you know, no, but it's very effective, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the same. And uh, and I, I, again, I feel like I don't know if I'm hopping from, I don't, uh, I don't like hopping from subject to subject always, but I had a, there was actually, there's two more things I really wanted to ask you about. Yeah. And, uh, there was, so the other one was, and I know how I feel about it, but I guess just coming from your mouth, it is going to, you might make a, a different point or something. And something else that I think a lot of people speak down upon is artificial sweeteners. <clears throat> what's, what's your stance on that? I don't have a pro I'm an artificial sweetener user. <laughs> so, so yeah. here's the yeah. thing, you know, everyone's deathly afraid of artificial sweeteners for health reasons or whatever. The, the research is really inconclusive. There's nothing that definitively says artificial sweeteners is connected to anything horrible, right? So there's that. If that changes in the future, cool. I'll change my stance too. But right now, mm -mm. Yeah. and and having like a pack of um, stevia in your coffee is not going to increase your sweet tooth or or make you gain fat or that's even crazier to me that people will say that it makes you I don't even get it it I don't I, you understand know it. I don't get it either it could actually help you stay on track with some things yeah. to be perfectly yeah. honest yeah. um if you're eating 12 packs of stevia a day well I would look at that that's probably not going to be a great thing because I'll tell you if they ever come with conclusive evidence about this it's going to be with eating massive quantities of it right yeah, yeah. like like all these things all the experiments they always do with mice or rats or something they're giving these rats massive amounts oh, it was of huge chunks. Yeah. like 100. yeah it's like none of us could eat something that much that we, yeah something that no human will have will ever do so but people get ah you know cancer what no 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 no. breathe breathe it's okay it's not going to ruin your life it's not going to and some people think it increases your sweet tooth i don't it does not no. if if 
if if someone's saying it does, I feel like they're using that as an excuse to eat sweets. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it increased my sweet tooth. Okay, that's why I'm eating so many more sweets. No, you're eating more sweets because you're choosing <laughs> to eat more sweets. It's not the stevia's fault. <laughs> it mm -hmm. didn't do that. But I feel like, you know, the artificial sweeteners, like in a diet soda, for instance, I don't do a lot of sodas in general. Every now and again, I love myself a good diet Coke though. And that, that doesn't, um, for, for me, I mean, it's just, I don't know, whatever is in diet Coke, whatever sweeteners in there, there's so many, I don't even know, but it doesn't increase anything for me. It just tastes good. And for people that are drinking regular sodas, like tons and tons of regular sodas, going to a diet soda is a great alternative and a great way to start scaling back, you know, but some people are like, Oh, soda, eh, eh. you know, you shouldn't be doing soda. And it's just like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Really? I like it just because it's something different once in a while. Yeah. 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 I like you know, it's so funny when I, when I go, I go and work with Jordan in, in Texas every month. And whenever we go, whenever I go there, I think every single time, at least one day we have a diet Coke at least, you know, and it's like, so, so literally probably once a month, that's, that, that's kind of when I do it. And that tastes so good. <laughs> yeah. It tastes so good. I, I love having it. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It, yeah. it's like you said, I think it just can help with staying on track, especially yes. if you have someone who, you know, all their life, they've probably just, I don't know, they've maybe overeaten in, in certain stuff and maybe, yeah. diet, and maybe sodas was one of them. And it's yeah. like you said, I think transitioning from making swaps here and there and being the soda to diet soda being one of them it, it works it works well and yeah. I think people who talk down on them probably I don't know if they just maybe maybe don't work with a certain population enough to have realized how good it can be or maybe you they're know, just generally it, misinformed I'm sure it comes from a good place but I, yeah I think it does and, and but I think two people are massively influenced by media you know, yeah. with this and they, and, you know, media is great about giving you just these little um, clips that, that don't tell the entire story. I mean, we see that all the time with everything, especially now um, with all subjects, right? The clickbait kind of stuff. Uh, um, and it, it's really not substantiated. So yeah, I wouldn't worry about the stevia, the splendor, whatever. It, but like I said, if you're doing 12, 15 packs, that is a problem. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's just <laughs> too much of anything, really. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, that included. Yeah, and um, and the final subject that I actually so this is actually maybe the biggest one because it's something I've been trying to really educate myself on recently, um, especially because the majority of the people I work with are female, and mm -hmm. it's something that comes up once in a while, and it's about so training during the time of the month. Huh? How? Yeah. So how should someone adjust for that? Uh, what, you know, what should they think about? How should they approach it? I don't think they need to change their training at all. I, okay. I don't, I mean, unless they physically have cramps or something like that, you know, and they can't, there's no reason to change your training, but there may be a reason to change your nutrition during that week and a half, 10 days, however long it is for somebody. Um, put, I, I like to tell people go into maintenance, put some more calories back in for that period of time, right? whatever it is for you, let's say it's a week for that week, let's get some calories on board. So you can keep doing your workout. So you feel like, you know, you can move. Um, and then when everything all said and done, you go back to where you were. Yeah. It is a lifesaver for a lot of people. And a lot of people don't even think of that mm. because they're afraid to put more calories on, on board because they're afraid of gaining weight because they know they're going to gain weight with their period anyway. And now if they eat more, they're going to gain even more. And in their head, they're thinking this is fat. None of it is, but in their head, they're thinking fat because they step on the scale and it goes up and they think it's up, it's fat, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and that's, you know, and that's erroneous thinking, obviously, you know, the scale weighs all, all of us, liquid bones, organs, muscle, fat, everything, not just fat, but in our head, it's only measuring fat, right? And so th there's a lot of hesitation to add more calories on board. But if you do, I think it prevents the overeating that will happen if you don't, mm. you know, people mm -hmm. that stick to their calorie deficit during that time. Oftentimes I hear people tell me I'll eat the wall. I am so hungry. I binge during this time. 
adding more calories is a great way to keep you level, you know, during that time. And then when you're done, you can hop back in. Mm. Well, it's very reassuring to hear because that's exactly the approach I've been taking. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So it's very, very good to hear because yeah, it's the exact type of things I have been hearing. I think appetite seems to go to, seems to be higher and, uh, and it's just something, you know, not only did I educate myself on, but it just makes sense if, if it's higher for about a week, see a little bit more because I, you know, at the end of the day, if, 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 if that can help maybe prevent you from overeating, then it's only going to keep you, you know, on track longer. And this can only be a good thing. And, uh, and I think trying to phrase it in that way that can make them realize that, okay, this is actually going to help my progress help. rather than slow yes. it down. Then that's, that's when it's like, I think it goes back to not understanding what maintenance does. Right. I think it's a misunderstanding of yeah. adding more calories. Wait a minute. I haven't reached my goal yet, you know, and thinking that they're not allowed to do that. They're going to ruin everything. Um, it's a misunderstanding of that. It's a misunderstanding of scale weight, what it actually measures, what it doesn't measure and, and, and how it's not just measuring fat. It's mm -hmm. measuring a lot of water retention, which is a big factor during that time, you know, um, and how people don't understand that for you to gain actual fat, you need to be eating at least 3,500 calories over your maintenance calories. And most of these people were in a deficit, right? So I point out to them, just think of how much you're going to have to eat on a Tuesday to gain a pound of fat by Wednesday. I mean, if you start crunching numbers, go ahead and start eating at 9 a.m. and let's see if you can do it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's when people hear it that way, they're like, oh, you know, I mean, logically, they know this. They do once you point that out. But emotion is sitting in the front part of their brain and is ready to run the show. And, and I tell people when you allow emotion to, to run the show, or, or as I like to say, drive the car, you're screwed because mm -hmm. you will for ever be chasing your tail. You will never progress as long as emotion is dictating what you do. You know, it's time to wake up the logic voices that are sitting in the back. I, I, I give everyone this visual. Logic voices are sitting in the back of your head, like on a lazy boy recliner with their feet up, sitting back, not doing anything while emotions in the front going, oh my God, you gained a pound of fat overnight. Oh my God. Oh my God. Now you got to reduce your calories. Blah, blah, blah. And the logic is sitting back there laughing their ass off sing, saying, you know, this is dumb. You know, you got to wake that guy up and get him out of the lazy boy and tell emotion just to shut up. Mm -hmm. No, I did not eat that much yesterday for me to gain a pound and a half of fat today. Mm -hmm. I know I did not. This is water retention, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to keep going straight. I'm not going to turn left. Like emotion wants me to do. I'm going to keep doing what I know I need to do. You yeah. know, that's kind of what it boils down to. And, uh, you know, I think this is, it, it kind of stems into the direction of, so I think psychology plays such a huge role in whether someone achieves their goal or not, because, you know, the longer I've been doing this, the more, you know, the more people I've been, I've been coaching, the more, the more people I've come across, the more people I've spoken to. And I've, I've noticed the reoccurring theme, and I'm sure you have too, is that the people who always negatively speak down on themselves always have a much tougher time of making progress or maybe they don't get to where they want to be at all and whereas on the other hand is the people who i notice maybe they're practicing gratitude more they they speak higher of themselves they they celebrate their small wins they make they they make progress and that's yeah. not a coincidence not at all i i think it's it, it it's like we don't treat our friends that way why do we treat ourselves that way? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you think about it, it's like, wow, yeah, you're right. You know, why am I being so hard on myself? I would never say what I'm saying to myself. I would never say to a friend mm -hmm. ever. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's like when we promise to, to do something for a friend, we do it. But if we promise ourselves, I'm not going to have those extra cupcakes today or whatever, we don't keep the promise to ourselves. Why is that? Why don't we keep a promise to ourselves? We do to a friend. We need to do it to ourselves. And, and to your point, we need to treat ourselves better. I mean, we we are we're dumping grounds for ourselves, you know? Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, yeah. And it's something that wasn't anything I ever would have, I ever thought about when I started doing this. You uh -huh. know, when I started, most people start training because they really like it. Um, but yeah, the more you do it, you it is really something, you, it's, it's so big, you notice it. 
there's so much psychology wrapped up in all of this stuff that we do. And it's interesting because I come from a psychology background. I'm a counselor and okay. it's, it, yeah, I, I was a school counselor for 33 years and where are you? I, I'm sorry. Where, where in the U S was that? Um, I'm right outside of Washington, DC. Okay. In Virginia, in oh, Northern Virginia. Virginia. Oh, Virginia. And, okay. Yeah. And I was a school counselor and teacher for 33 years. And I use my skills in that area every single day, okay. every single day. And when I first got certified, I was a school counselor when I got certified as a trainer. And what was interesting was the communication piece, the understanding people piece. I already did that. I already knew how to do that. Right. And that's the part where a lot of people get overwhelmed with because they, they, they don't understand the psychology behind it, because that takes time to figure out and, and practice and and um, and listening skills and all that kind of stuff. I mean, counseling has come in handy without a doubt, because there is so much psychology based in all of this. Yeah, that's a great background to come from because it's something it I actually really want to get involved in more. It, it is. It's been super helpful. It's it's one of those things when I was a counselor and I loved working out in the gym, I thought, okay, cool. I do this for a living. I love doing this and I love going to the gym. Let's marry the two. You know, that's how I ended up getting certified. And work, then I started working part-time as an in-person trainer while I was still a school counselor. Um, and then, you know, business kind of grew after I retired. Um, but yeah, it's a great... It, it complements each other very well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, otherwise, so we, we are coming towards the end because I don't want to keep you too long. But before, I, I like to sometimes play like a, a little underrated, overrated game with everyone okay. that comes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, of course, it's just your opinion. You can yeah, uh, you can say what you want. And there's a few things here, some fitness related, some un, uh, not fitness related. Okay. Let's go through them. So first of all, uh, low fat ice cream. You know, I would have said underrated before, but I'm an overrated now. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of like, you know, after you have regular ice cream, it's just kind of like, no, you know, and that doesn't mean you need to eat the whole Ben and Jerry's or whatever, you know, have some of it, but it's, it's much better just to have the real stuff. I think, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like all the I other, agree. yeah, the, the, the low fat, the no fat, no, not anymore. Yeah. And and low fat ice cream was something I was having for a good while. So the first time I was ever trying to lose weight, I found it, it really did help me at the time. Sure. But totally I agree. I think now, like, I've been having a lot of, I don't know how to, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Carte Dior, something like that. It's a lovely ice cream brand, Carte, Carte Dior, maybe, I don't know if we have it in the US, but I've been having that every day, regular ice cream, man, it's so good. And it's so good. I know for a fact, if I tried low fat ice cream again, I would not want it. No, no. I mean, if you're in a position where, where you can incorporate the real, definitely do it. I can understand if you're trying to save calories and you want to have just a little something that's kind of close. Okay. I would get it, but it, for the most part, yeah. Overrated. Okay. BOSU ball squats. What kind of squats? BOSU, so squatting on a BOSU ball. Oh my God. Don't even do it. I mean, yeah. it, no, it, I mean, it, I, but I was one of those people that used to do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a BOSU ball over here in the corner and um, literally I, I use it when I am, I put it on the flat part and I will lay back on it if I need some support for something, um, especially doing a stretch or something. Um, it, it, is, it is the dumbest thing to do. It, everyone says it works balanced. No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's not any kind of balance that you're ever going to have to navigate in your entire life, most likely. And most people like to stand on top of the flat part while the ball's wobbly. And the manufacturer even says, don't do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and people do that. So um, no, I, I don't think I don't think a BOSU ball is really a valid piece of equipment for most things at all, especially yeah, yeah. squats. I mean, how dangerous can you be loading that squat on something that's unstable? Yeah. Think about that. That yeah. makes no sense. It doesn't. I think people just do it because it looks different and more yeah. exciting than regular exercises. Uh, but obviously, yeah, there's, it's just not a good idea. Uh, no. Dun Dunkin' Donuts? Mm. I know people may hate me. I'm going to say overrated. I'm not a Duncan fan. I, I don't like their coffee um, at all. I've never I, tried it. The coffee well, the coffee. problem I have, I think their coffee is probably okay, but they make it for you. Meaning if you want a little bit of cream or you want whatever, they'll do it behind the thing. You don't get to do it yourself. Invariably you say, I just want a splash of cream and your coffee comes out almost 
like white, right? Because they've put so much cream in there. They don't have any idea or training on amounts of things. And that drives me absolutely crazy. Um, so yeah, I don't do much of anything. I don't, and their donuts are just okay. You know, there's so many other little niche donut places that open up that blow Dunkin' Donuts out of the water. Even our grocery store donuts are better than that. Yeah, I'm here. going to the US next month. And uh, I really, I'll, I love donuts and uh, I want to find a, a good donut. You will find donuts everywhere. Yeah, I, I will to, tell I'm you. I'm going to Texas, so I need to find something good. Uh, so where in Texas are you going? Uh, so I'm going to go to Houston a lot. I'm going to spend a little bit of time in Dallas as well. And when you're in Dallas, go to a place. I think it's called Star. Uh, Star. I'm going to send it to you when I have it. Because I have ordered, when I go to Texas, I've ordered delivery to my hotel of these donuts and I take them up to Jordan's. Um, I'm going to send it to you because I don't remember the exact name for when you're in Dallas. You have to go there. Those donuts are unbelievable. Oh, 100%. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll have to try it because, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apple cider vinegar. Oh, my God. So overrated. Don't even. Don't, e don't even tell me for a salad dressing. Just don't. Just don't. Yeah. Yeah. No, I it's agree. awful. It's uh, awful. Creatine monohydrate. Um, so I think that's probably very underrated. I am not a creatine user and I will put that out there. And people are very surprised about that. I just, um, and ask me why I have nothing against creatine at all. I just, you know, back when I started getting serious about this, I didn't even know about it, to be honest, that was ignorance. I just didn't even know about it. And I thought, you know what, I need to get my act together before I start popping in some creatine or whatever. Um, and I just started building muscle just fine. And I'm like, why do I need to add something? I really don't feel like I need to. Um, but that being said, a lot of new stuff coming out about potential cognitive benefits with creatine. And so from that perspective, I'm like, mm, I may give creatine a shot now, but um, I think for most people, completely underrated and something that you ought to look into. But I also tell people this, make sure you kind of have your ducks in a row, meaning you're consistent with training. Cause if you're not, don't take creatine. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for you to take creatine if you're not consistent and lifting heavy weight really, yeah, um, and, unless you're going for just the cognitive piece. But if you're, if you're newer to strength training, let's get you in a strength training habit into a program, consistent effort. You've got your nutrition for whatever your goals are. You've got that kind of down. Now, now let's add it. That makes more sense. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, okay. Last one now. And this is getting very popular is the popularity for it has been growing, growing a lot recently collagen collagen protein powder yeah underrated I me mean, overrated sorry no I'm, I'm like no i have you know overrated i just don't think it, it's not a complete pro protein so it shouldn't count towards your protein intake goal is it going to hurt you no um will it do anything for your hair and nails i don't know i hear it does i mean maybe if if you don't have much hair, you need your, your hair is kind of dull or whatever. I don't know. You have problems with your nails. Give it a shot. Someone once though told me that they were taking it for, was it some joint issues maybe? I don't know. And that that seemed to help them. That was completely anecdotal. So I don't have any knowledge really about that, but yeah, I wouldn't waste your money on collagen. I'm not sure why it's like a thing. I don't know. Yeah. Why do you think it's a thing? I think every, I think just every once in a while, there'll be supplements that grow in popularity and then there'll be supplements that fade away. I remember, um, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, when I, when I was younger a few years ago, l cartonin Oh, yeah, yeah, really yeah. Popular. I haven't, I don't hear about that ever nowadays. Ever. Someone asked me about that um, maybe, was it yesterday or two days ago? For the first time, I'm like, whoa, I haven't heard that like in a year, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Where's that been? Yeah. Uh, but, um, and it's so I, funny she asked because the guy at the store was trying to get her to buy it mm, and i'm like well probably so because he probably hasn't sold any of it probably <laughs> behind the glass and you need a key yeah. to get to it um, yeah yeah i think collagen so i think collagen is just growing in popularity right now i think it will die down as well because i think if at the end of the day if someone's just looking for protein then just go for a whey protein if you can stomach it or uh, yeah or like a whey ice some you know yeah something it, better. Yeah. it makes more sense um, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. But um, otherwise, yeah, we're, we're done with the list. Overrated, underrated. Susan, thank you so much. Where can people find you? Sure. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Susan Niebergall Fitness. You can find me on YouTube, Susan Niebergall Fitness. Um, Facebook, the same name. Um, at the Inner Circle, sfinnercircle.com. And my book is 
um, fit at any age. It's never too late. And that's on Amazon. Okay. I'll link it in the show notes for you. Um, but Perfect. otherwise, thank you. again, thank you so much for coming on, Susan. I appreciate that you've taken the time out to come speak to me a lot. It means a lot. So again, thank you very much. And uh, otherwise, take care. Thank you for having me. This has been great.